Before taking office, President Jair Bolsonaro was never that fond of China. In just a decade, the Asian giant has leapfrogged every other country in the world to become Brazil's undisputed number one trading partner. One quarter of Brazilian exports and almost half of Brazilian commodities go to China. A partir do momento que a China, com a população sete vezes superior à nossa, começa a comprar terras agricultáveis, ela vai ter a garantia alimentar em suas mãos. In a nutshell, Brazil has never been so dependent on one single country. Perhaps that's why President Jair Bolsonaro has become more pragmatic when it comes to Beijing. He is sending his agriculture minister and vice president there in May and promised to visit Chairman Xi Jinping himself later this year. China is just one of the subjects opposing the government's ideological zealots, which loathe the Asian juggernaut, and the more pragmatist conservatives, more interested in selling goods and getting technology from China. Who will win? The health of the Brazilian economy hangs on that question. This week we will talk about how China became so important to Brazil, what it wants from us, and how Brazil should position itself towards Beijing. My name is Gustavo Ribeiro, Editor-in-Chief of the Brazilian Report. This is Explaining Brazil. A few decades ago, a running joke illustrated the extent to which the United States impacted Brazil's economy. When the U.S. catches a cold, Brazil is hit with pneumonia. Not anymore. Since the beginning of the century, Brazil's fortunes rely on how much China imports on basic goods, like beef, soybeans, iron ore, and oil. But the Brazil-China relationship is still a young one according to Mauricio Santoro, an international relations professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. In 1974, during the Ernesto Geisel administration, Brazil recognized communist China, Beijing, as the legitimate government of China. So that's interesting because we had at the time a military dictatorship in Brazil, very anti-communist, but it had a pragmatic approach to foreign relations, and it was more or less following the lead of the United States at the time, and uh, understood that Beijing, and not Taiwan, was the key partner in this dialogue with China, with the Chinese overseas community, you name it. And so it was the beginning of the modern relationship between Brazil and China. So we are talking about 45 years of relationships. And... Uh, during the, the Sarney administration in the 1980s, Brazil and China signed a very important technological agreement. So they started to, to exchange technology and, and, and knowledge about the building of artificial satellites. So in the last 30 years, Brazil and China have launched uh, five satellites. In December 24, a Chinese rocket soared into space with the observation satellite Cybers-4, a joint mission by the China-Brazil Earth Resources Satellite Program, established in 1988. In a couple of years, the sixth satellite in the series, the Cybers-4A, is scheduled for liftoff. So this is a very big scientific and technological program. I think that probably it's the biggest one between two developing countries. And I think it's something that many Brazilians uh, don't know, even today, that we have such a strong technological and scientific cooperation with China. And uh, one that has been very important for Brazil for many uh, reasons. For example, these satellites have been uh, a key part in the efforts to curb deforestation in Brazil. They also have been very important in the agribusiness sector to make the, the previews about the weather, to what's going on, if we're going to have heavy rains or, or droughts in Brazil. But it would be only at the turn of the 21st century that trade between the two countries would pick up the pace. Until then, Japan was Brazil's biggest trade partner in Asia. But then came the commodities boom of the early 2000s, driven by a peak in demand for basic goods from emerging markets such as India and especially China. 
From building new power stations at breakneck speed to flexing its growing muscle in the international oil arena, China has been all about growth, with a seemingly unquenchable thirst for raw materials to fuel its booming economy. We can't say that Brazil had prepared for this new reality. The country was more reactive, but it profited big time. Exports rose, agribusiness thrived, and the country managed to reduce poverty for a while. But there was a flip side to that new booming relationship. Especially if we look to the Brazilian industry, which is not very competitive abroad, and it was not able to prevent uh, this rising competition from China to, to, to remain competitive with the cheaper Chinese goods. So it created lots of problems in many industrial sectors, such as toys, uh, shoes, and uh, other kinds of um, cheap products that weren't able to compete with China. Over the years, the Brazil-China relationship has proven to be a very asymmetrical one. According to the Brazilian government, 87% of our exports to the Asian country are made up of only five products soybeans, iron ore, beef, oil, and cellulose. So Brazil basically exports commodities, uh, low-cost products, and it imports from China uh, a wide range of industrial goods, which are actually uh, more expensive, so create some problems for Brazilian companies. But there is also the issue of investments, and we have many Brazilian companies investing in China building factories, working with Chinese partners. So, for example, Embraer uh, makes airplanes in China, in the Arbin city in the northeast of China. Marco Polo uh, makes autobus in China and other types of vehicles. There are also many textile industries from the south of Brazil who created factories and offices in China because they want to benefit from the cheap cost of work or the cheap cost of energy or any other other things that makes make China competitive. So there is this, this two ways of thinking about that. And it's very difficult to imagine that Brazil is going to be able to sell China, sell to China manufactured products such as uh, automobiles or computers or things like that, because Brazil is really not competitive in all these fields. So it's not the problem that Brazil is not able to sell to China, it's not able to sell to the United States or to the European Union. It's the general lack of competitive uh, capacity in Brazil right now. One of the main roadblocks for Brazil's competitiveness is a lack of infrastructure, something China is eager to help us with. More on that after the break. Of every 100 spam messages sent in the world, five come from Brazil. And spam is not only annoying, it poses a real security threat for companies with their conspicuous links. If you want to protect your company's environment, team up with FastHelp. FastHelp is a Brasilia-based IT company that is focused on cybersecurity. Go to fasthelp.com.br for more information. fasthelp.com.br for decades, Chinese foreign policy was characterized by its low profile. Former leader Deng Xiaoping said it was important to hide your capabilities and bide your time. But it's safe to say the times have changed in Beijing. Current chairman Xi Jinping wants China to have a more prominent role in world politics through his Belt and Road Initiative, also known as the New Silk Road. The most ambitious infrastructure project in modern history that's designed to reroute global trade. And it's how China plans to become the world's next superpower. Over 60 countries have signed deals for these projects, always sold by Beijing as win-win situations. The Belt and Road is started out as basically a land and sea connection between Europe and China. This is Charles Tang, head of the Brazil-China Chamber of Commerce and Industry. But the concept of the Belt and Road has expanded. Now it encloses the whole world in the sense of speedy, efficient, less expensive connection with China. So Brazil has an important role to play in the Belt and Road Initiative. And I believe that Brazil should 
sign an agreement, being a belt and road partner like Italy did, like Greece did, okay, because by doing that, Brazil will have a tremendous amount of investment and business opportunities. You know, some of my friends in the United States keep on saying to me, we, we can't stop China from growing. Let's join them and make money, which is what the Europeans decided to do, which makes sense. It's not as if Chinese companies weren't already here. More than any other country in the world, China is pouring billions into the Brazilian economy. For every 10 Brazilian reals invested in the country between 2015 and 2017, three of them came from China. Mr. Tang lists other environment projects. The $1.7 billion investment in the Porto de Itaqui in the, the north of Brazil, the uh, by Oceanic Railway. There's another railway project from uh, Curumba, Curumba through Paraguay to Argentina to Antifagas, you know, the port in the coast of Chile. So you can take the Brazilian grain, the Paraguayan grain, the Argentinian grain to the Pacific you know, and shorten the distance to China. You see, China needs to buy, you know, China needs to ensure the food security for the Chinese people. And that's priority. China invented a new system of international relations. Since the beginning of history, stronger nations dominated the weaker nations by sending their armies. China do, does not send its marines to anywhere. China basically sends its business people its executives, its entrepreneurs, to trade and to invest in the world. So, of course China gains, but the world gains. You know, so by building infrastructure of Africa, today it transformed Africa from a forgotten continent to a continent of hope. Because infrastructure is the basis for the development of any country. Chinese investment patterns in Brazil reflect the same trend in various African countries. Usually companies owned by or closely linked to this Chinese state have begun with mineral extraction, venturing shortly thereafter into energy production and infrastructure. And while a wide range of economic groups welcome this presence, it has certainly been met with skepticism by many, who believe that this inflow of investments may just be a new form of colonialism. It's a very different psychology between the Chinese people and the Brazilian people. One of the reasons why China grew so fast is because China chased one of the top priorities for China was attracting foreign investment. China discriminated against the Chinese companies in China. Foreign companies paid 10% less income tax than Chinese companies. And that lasted for almost 30 years, okay? And it was finally ended in the financial crisis. So China has a view that, you know, the foreigners bring their capital. They create jobs for the Chinese people. They bring their technology. One day they're gonna leave and it's all ours. Brazilians have an opposite point of view. Oh, you know, the petroleum is ours. It's under the earth, we don't have the money or the technology to bring it up, you know, to enrich the people or the country. We will continue poor, but it's ours. <laughs> so that's a different uh, mentality, you know. And the, oh, the foreigners are coming in, they're going to control everything. But there is nothing. <laughs> so, you know. Mr. Tang points out that the sentiment towards Beijing from Brazilians is somewhat in line with the United States' stance on China. But he warns that siding with the U.S. could be a nil-advised move by Brazil. There is no reason why Brazil should not have a great relationship with the United States and with China. But, you know, Brazilians know that the United States is a competitor. China is the market. Once the agreement is made with the United States to end the trade war, 
Brazil will sell less soybeans, will sell less beef, will sell less chicken, etc. You know, I mean, the Chinese market is huge, but it can only buy so much. So it buys from the U.S., it's going to buy less from Brazil. It buys from more from Brazil, it's going to buy less from the U.S. Next, how Brazil should position itself between Washington and Beijing. In 2020, Brazil's new data protection law comes into effect, and companies managing user data will have to adapt to the new regulations. Perhaps the good people of FastHelp can guide you in protecting your data. FastHelp is a Brasilia-based IT company that is focused on cybersecurity. Protect your business by teaming up with FastHelp. Go to fasthelp.com.br for more information on how to protect your company's virtual space. When we talk about infrastructure investments, we automatically think roads, bridges, railways. But the real issue of the near future will be telecommunications. Western companies are racing China to develop 5G technology. In simple terms, 5G is a much faster form of computing. How much faster? About 100 times faster. At the center of the dispute is Huawei, a Chinese titan that is racing ahead of American competitors. Its ties with the Chinese government has led to security concerns. The U.S. has forbidden government contractors from dealing with Huawei, and the White House is reportedly lobbying Brazil to do the same. This is a big issue for China, and Chinese are going to put lots of pressure on Brazil because of that. And of course, the United States also, want, also wants Brazil to close its market to the Chinese products. I think that it creates some good opportunities for Brazil. Brazilians can uh, use this big political struggle between these two great powers in order to extract, extract the maximum benefits from each of them. But it's not an easy movement, and Brazil's go, Brazilian government is going to need to pay lots of attention to what's going on, to identify what are the Brazilian national interests in all these big conflicts, and to, to, have the, the, to get the best deal. And this is not going to be easy, especially if Brazil falls in the trap of an automatic alliance with any country. That can be real bad for Brazil. This is the time to be pragmatic. This is the time to exploit the opportunities that this new changing world order presents to Brazil and to other developing countries. Do you think Brazil is doing that, is acting objectively? No, I don't think so. I am quite concerned about this new orientation in Brazilian foreign policy. I think that this effort to become, to create a special relationship with the United States, it's very complicated. It's not the right moment to do that. The Trump administration is not showing any interest in creating a strong partnership with Latin American nations such as Brazil. But I also see more pragmatic groups inside the government, especially the agribusiness sector. For example, uh, agricultural exports of Brazil, nowadays the majority of them goes to, to Asia, not just to China, but also to India, to Southeast Asia. So it's a sector of the economy which is very important in the current administration. And they are worried about what's going on and they are right lighting the importance of, of the Chinese relationship. Indeed, it is complicated to have an objective view on a country we know so little about. Few Brazilians speak Mandarin, even among diplomats, scholars, or executives with business interests in Asia. Scholarship programs are not that common. And this lack of familiarity breeds fear and misunderstanding. Yes, this is a serious problem. There is a, a knowledge gap in Brazil about China. And this, this lack of good studies or good analysts about China, they make it more difficult for Brazil to enjoy the opportunities that are uh, going on right now. And often Brazilians' business leaders and political leaders have a very outdated view of China, a very obsolete view about what's going on in the Chinese economy, in Chinese politics, which is usually a second-hand view from American and European news outlets. So they are failing to identify what Brazil can gain from the, the Chinese market, from Chinese political projects.
2019 could be crucial for Brazil-China relations. In May, the Agriculture Minister and the Vice President will visit Beijing as two voices defending a more pragmatic view of China. In November, Brasilia will host the BRICS Summit. Not to mention the Beijing visit Jair Bolsonaro has promised. This podcast was written and prepared by me, Gustavo Ribeiro. Maria Marta Bruno produces this show. And Ewan Marshall edits the final script. If you like this podcast, spread us on any platform you may be listening to Explain in Brazil. It takes only a second, but it is really important for us. The best way to support Explaining Brazil is to subscribe to The Brazilian Report, the journalistic company behind this podcast. Every day we have new content about Brazilian politics, finance, and society. We've also got exclusive newsletter services if you want to be briefed about what's going on in Brazil before starting your day. Subscribe now for a free trial and enjoy all of our content for seven days. And it's really free. You don't have to submit any credit card information whatsoever. Just go to brazilian.report slash subscribe. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is at Brazilian Report. That's all for now. See you next week. Thank you.